Uh, we have somebody shut the door back there so we can get started. Uh, you guys are in the lightning talks session. This is 45 minutes of uh, talks that are broken down into five minutes a piece. Right now we've got four of them scheduled. Three of them are going to be done by Andrew Petro. So he's going to start us off and just do them in succession so we don't have to uh, unplug him and plug him back in uh, over and over again. Anybody else here uh, that wants to contribute to a lightning talk? Raise your hand. Anybody have anything prepared? You have one prepared? Are you, did you get your slide deck working? Yeah, it works. Oh, okay. So we're, we're going to plug and unplug even less. Oh, okay. So you're going to share? Okay, good deal. So we got four of them. Anybody else have one prepared? That, they want to do a lightning talk? Yes, I think I'm the sixth guy. Misa, okay. All right, so uh, with some work for the presenters, we'll just uh, give you a three, two, one, and then you'll be done. You can move on to your next one. Right. Yeah, yeah. Everybody, Andrew Petro. Hi. Um, what's that? Hey, it was works, and I'll start my timer here. Great, we got three of these things. Um, the opinions are my own. Uh, first talk, <laughs> I'd like to talk about universal two-factor authentication, a, a FIDO standard. Uh, so here we go. Uh, FIDO, UTF, what? Uh, universal uh, two-factor authentication. Uh, so here's the deal, right? Uh, phishing, ever heard of phishing? Phishing is bad, phishing is bad. So, so phishing is where um, you know, through social engineering or otherwise, users are convinced to give their passwords to sites, people, entities that they really shouldn't. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this past year was kind of, I don't know, kind of surreal. Um, and so once upon a time, there was, you know, some kind of presidential campaign, and there were staff in that campaign, and, and, uh, and there was some email. And there was, there was some phishing. There was, there was an email with kind of clicking on a link and maybe giving your credentials kind of accidentally to people you probably shouldn't have. And, uh, and it made a big mess. And what we need is to engineer systems and technologies to protect users, support users, so that that doesn't happen. Uh, and that's really what this is about. Passwords, they're hard, they're not much fun, they're not okay. Um, you end up having to have these long, difficult passwords that, that I certainly can't remember. Um, so then, you know, maybe you store it into your browser and let Google persist it to the cloud for you. Uh, that might be cool. Or you could put it in a password journal. Uh, that might be pretty cool too. Actually, a you know, thoughtful consideration of, of risk factors. Maybe this is where you want to end up. Uh, with your passwords, but really I think we just want to not have passwords. So instead of written passwords, instead of you know, these strings that are hard to remember and so then we write them down somewhere that we're going to lose or someone's going to get at them, we really need to get beyond passwords. And that's what uh, the U2F, you know, Universal Two-Factor Standard is about. It's about being able to have a physical token. You can get your token in your USB form factor. You can get it in a USB-C form factor for people with better Macs than I have. You can get it with uh, this kind of Neo near field communication thing with, with people with fancier phones than I have. Uh, so, so it's not just you know, legacy USB. Uh, from multiple vendors, you can get these tokens. And the tokens speak a protocol that uh, I don't have time to explain. Maybe I don't even understand. I stole this slide from a uh, in common uh, identity access management forum talk. It's cited at the end. Um, Keith Hazelton actually was, was involved in that talk. Small world. So here's the deal. Um, there's some kind of protocol, and the protocol involves offloading the encrypted secret up onto the server of the site that you're working with. Why? So we can scale this sucker up so that one token can work with lots and lots and lots of sites, and it's okay. You're still you know, private across the sites. You can't, can't cross-correlate the identity across the sites, and you don't, you don't have to have some giant storage on this because there's, it's not how it works. Um, and so what this device is doing is, is generating public-private key pairs and, and signing 
uh, assertion, signing uh, uh, bundles to prove that you are the holder of the device, that you have the device. Um, so that's cool. Uh, where are we going here? So maybe I should demo it. Maybe that would help understand what's going on here. So let's do that. So this is our Git, uh, GitLab server at the University of Wisconsin. Happens to use this. So I go and sign in with Shibboleth. And hey, look, remembered my password, because passwords are kind of inconvenient. Um, and hit log in, and then you come back here, and it says, hey, you got this two-factor authentication turned on. So what you're really going to need to do is you know, plug in your two-factor advice. So what you can't see here, and I was slow, so I'll just try again, no worries. And you press the little button to kind of communicate the intent that you want to use it. And faster than I can tell you what happened, in I am, logged in. I didn't have to copy a six-digit number off my phone. I didn't have to... Um, receive a text message, you didn't have to do any of that. A uh, physical device to provide that additional authentication factor using an open protocol um, and, and really with, with open source libraries to implement this. So this is in fact way cool. Um, there's a plugin for the, the latest and greatest Shibboleth IDP uh, that is you know, a work in progress, but certainly a starting point there. Uh, there's an email thread about that up on the whatever. Uh, and then here in this community, we got CAS. And uh, right in the CAS manual, there's documentation about the uh, uh, U2F you know, add-on. You just, in your dependencies, declare this sucker. Time's up on two-factor authentication. Oh, no. Uh, Thank you, Andrew Petro. Next up is static site generators for the win. Andrew Petro. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. Again. And again. Let me get my timer started again. There we go. All right, so let's move on to static site generators. So uh, here's see, the problem is that doesn't zap my tabs the way I intended. There we go. All right, so uh, this morning uh, I was trying to figure out um, you know the conference schedule. And uh, I wasn't on my laptop. I was actually on my, my phone, so it looked more like this. And I go in the menu, and you know, it's close, but that navigation, it's not in there. And you know, that's too bad. So then I got up out of bed and went to my, went to my laptop and got the schedule. And, and life was good. But you look at something like that, and you say, you know, what am I going to do about it? Um, you know, maybe I could log in and fix it if I remembered how to log in and if I had those credentials and if I knew anything about Drupal. Um, or I guess I could complain about it. I could politely email on an email list and say, hey, we're missing a link on the website, and, and maybe somebody could update that. Um, and, and, you know, that's a thing. That's fine. Uh, what, or we got the page about you know, the, the AngularJS portal project. And, and really, we've actually changed names. We're not called AngularJS portal anymore. So it'd be good to update this. How am I going to update that? Well, I guess I could log in. Um, I want to talk about a different approach to websites. I want to talk about static site generators. So the idea is that we can have uh, text files. We can have source code for a website. We can run a program and generate from that uh, static HTML, CSS, JavaScript, whatever it's going to be, static files that are all done. They're all done. They're all generated. We don't need a database anymore. We don't need a server. We don't need PHP. We don't need any of that. Just static files. Uh, could be served up by a CDN. Could be pushed out to the periphery of the internet for a really fast performance. Um, and so the resulting product is simpler. Uh, and that's what we're doing for documentation for, you know, say, the, the incubating you know, uPortal Home AngularJS portal project, is that there's uh, you know, the Git repo. Uh, you know, GitHub makes this nice, but this is not a GitHub story. This is a text file story. And so in the docs directory, there's done to done a bunch of plain old text files. And you can look at the text files, and you can understand the text files. It you know, renders them nicely, but they're really just text files. And then uh, we generate from that uh, the website for the product. And this is really nice because it's in source control with the product so that when you go change the product, when you enhance the product, when you add a feature to the product, you should probably document that feature. And you can do that in the same transaction because the website is driven by text files that are in source control. And then there's a program that generates you know, the website from those text files. Uh, 
And this is so cool that the uPortal project itself uh, is doing this now as well. Again, there's a docs directory, and then from that, you, know, um, you can generate the, the website with documentation. Uh, and then, you know, this isn't a GitHub story, but GitHub sure is nice in that now I can propose changes to the documentation. Uh, and so here I am, and, and somebody thinks these are so good, they've added like emoji comments. And, and wouldn't you know, every single time I, I propose to include a little bit of shell script example, um, Christian Murphy's going to remind me to highlight that properly because we got code review going on in here. Um, and the point is, it's text files. And for some purposes, uh, text files are a good thing. You know, developers uh, have the tool chains, have the experience collaborating on text files. And so a solution that, that takes text files and generates websites from them is really attractive. Um, you can get hands-on experience trying this out. Uh, Misa Moyed uh, has done a great job, I think, spearheading this idea in Aperio. And there's this aperio.github.io blog. Um, and, and it works in this way, where, where the blog website is generated you know, from text files uh, that are in source control. And they can be, you know, changes can be proposed to those via pull request. Um, static site generators aren't the solution to everything. But they're definitely the solution to some things. And I think we need to be looking for I mean, where are the right opportunities to apply this technology. I, I have 20 more seconds. And, and uh, it's, the, it's different layers of openness. right? Drupal and WordPress are open source. But a solution with static site generators lets you know, not just the, the hosting platform, but you know, really the program for generating the site, all the source of the site, all the metadata, let all that, that be open and visible and transparent. Petro as well. Last one, though. Last one you got to put up with. Um, so let's talk about uh, CVE IDs. Um, actually, I'm just going to tabs. So uh, CVE identifiers, you know, common vulnerabilities and exposures identifiers, they're, they're just a canonical way of referring to, identifying, talking about vulnerabilities in our software, which you know, can be really important. Um, and so there's this kind of hierarchical scheme of uh, naming authorities, numbering authorities, that can issue these identifiers. And um, you know, the authority, the, the grab bag authority, the, the fallback authority for uh, open source um, vulnerability, uh, vulnerabilities in open source software is an organization called uh, the Distributed Weakness Filing Project. Um, and so that's where, you know, say, Aperio projects would get their identifiers if we're going to continue to rely upon you know, that provider. But it's, but it's a pyramid scheme. It's a, it's a hierarchy. And so if we wanted to, if we had the resources to do it, Aperio could pursue being a naming authority, a numbering authority, uh, you know, kind of downstream from, underneath the, the DWF project, the Distributed Weakness Filing Project. And this would give Aperio a little more control, a little more capacity around you know, issuing these identifiers to our projects. And, and again, why would we want to do this? Well, it becomes a canonical way of talking about uh, vulnerabilities in our software. And so you know, because this has been done for you know, say some historical uPortal vulnerabilities. When I go and search the master database of uh, you know, common vulnerabilities and exposures, registered vulnerabilities, I search uPortal, I can find them. And, and then there's metadata about you know, what versions of the software are affected. And this becomes uh, data to work with in uh, tooling and reporting. And so if you know, someone like Docker Hub was going to implement scanning of uh, Docker containers as they do to kind of give you the heads up of, oh, your container contains software that is known to have certain vulnerabilities of these severities. Uh, these become identifiers to latch onto. Um, they're also useful in uh, coordinating understanding and communication about vulnerabilities that are not maybe fully public yet. 
right? Uh, I'm working on you know, solving a vulnerability. Are you working on the same vulnerability I'm working on? Well, I don't know. I guess we'd have to like have full disclosure and explain to one another what vulnerability we're working on, or we could could use an identifier uh, that that has been you know uniquely issued to each vulnerability to to compare notes. Um, so, CV IDs they're just identifiers, uh, but they're handy identifiers. They're kind of uh, good security practice identifiers. I think they can add value to Aperio projects, uh, and I think we can lubricate the getting of, the managing of, the embargoing of, the, the carefully releasing of these uh, CVE identifiers by Aperio becoming a numbering authority. And so the call to action on this one, you know, there's been some list traffic about this. I think we need to, we need to follow up on that and um, and really pursue Aperio becoming a, a CVE numbering authority you know, within the scope of our projects. And that's what I got. And I think that'll work. Is that doing what it probably should be doing? Next up is getting started with Karuta uh, with Eric Dickenwa. Uh, hello, I'm, I'm going to give you an example of how uh, we easily uh, built a small project with uh, um, Karuta. Uh, so let's talk about uh, our needs. Uh, in our case, we want to uh, develop some projects uh, around e-portfolios to be able to manage the skills of uh, our students and the follow-up of their internship in the uh, companies. Uh, to develop this project, we chose uh, Kauta, but we had to learn uh, how uh, it actually works uh, first. So creating a small project was uh, a good place to begin with. Uh, before talking about what Karuta uh, is, uh, let's define what Karuta is not. Uh, it's not a, a static portfolio uh, model. Uh, the first time you log into Karuta, uh, you find nothing. Uh, it's an empty shell. Uh, Karuta is also not a programming language. Uh, no restrictions, no conditions, uh, and so on. So it's not a ready-to-use software. Uh, using Karuta requires uh, some efforts, uh, but honestly, those are quite simple uh, manipulation to, uh, to, if you have a well-defined goal. Uh, Karuta is a kind of uh, modeling past. Uh, if you don't have a clear ID uh, of what you want to achieve, uh, you will get uh, a poor result. But, but if your project is well defined, uh, it will greatly help you mastering uh, Karuta. Uh, now let's define our project. Uh, so this project have had uh, three goals. Uh, we wanted to support our students in their search for internship, but also help tutors monitor uh, their uh, students' progress. And of course, uh, we would like to help our designers learn how to use uh, Karuta. Uh, here is an, an overview of the project. Uh, each student uh, has to find a company to do their internship. Uh, tutor follows several students in this task. Uh, he interacts uh, with each of them to get uh, uh, some information, like have you uh, gotten any uh, contacts uh, back from the companies you applied to? Uh, how did you reach them? Uh, email, phone, etc. Uh, and so uh, he can give uh, them uh, advice and ask uh, further questions. Uh, here is the, the student view. Uh, you can see the main uh, e-portfolio. The skin is responsive and uh, can be modified by the designer. Um, the student can easily add uh, or delete companies. Uh, he can change the order, edit the company's name, uh, add a description, etc. Uh, the tutor has the possibility to add uh, feedback, uh, advice, and comments. Uh, 
on the Karuta homepage, uh, we find a list of uh, existing uh, e-portfolios. A uh, specific icon indicates which kind of e-portfolio is it. Uh, it can be uh, main portfolio, rubrics portfolio, or component portfolio. Uh, main portfolio can be constructed from uh, elements of uh, other portfolios. Uh, in rubrics, we find some form like uh, yes or no uh, fields or list of choices. Uh, in the portfolio components, uh, we can find reusable uh, object uh, as the, the contact follow-up item. Uh, the designer is the main role in Karuta. He creates uh, portfolios, uh, of course, uh, dashboard uh, and uh, batch processing. Uh, he also uh, defines uh, the name and scope of uh, the different roles. Uh, Tutors can uh, access the, the portfolio of each one of uh, the students they follow. A tutor can also access a dashboard, uh, summarizing the, the, the main information about each student. Uh, this has the possibility to uh, look at the progress of their uh, internship uh, search. To create a dashboard, uh, a tool helps the designer extract uh, specific information from the, the student's portfolio. Thank you very much. Next up, Organic Software Systems with Misa Moyed. Hey. Excellent. So let me quickly get set up here. I have no slides, so I'm just going to rant on for about five minutes until Tim stops me. Um, so the, the title of the talk is called Organic Software Systems, Organic Software Architectures. And this is what I learned from, from a gentleman um, from Cloud Foundry at Pivotal who gave this talk under very different names that I unfortunately could not find on YouTube anywhere to share with you. But um, he was describing this idea, oh, and, and his name was Matt Stein, if you want to look him up, um, from Cloud Foundry. And he's, he's going on and on about a software architecture that is organic. What does that actually mean? Is that like a software system whose deployment and configuration is friendly to your blood level, I don't know, cholesterol and so on? Um, you laugh, but you're not entirely wrong. So if you scan today's literature, you will find that most people recommend and advocate for software design and approaches to architecture that are anti-fragile. That's like the pure academic word. What does anti-fragile mean? And so if you asked everybody in this audience, you said, can you give us a definition for anti-fragile and fragile, you would likely come up with definitions that are um, resilient, indestructible, robust, and solid, and everybody is trying to build systems that, are, you know, that, that, that have these characteristics. And you're perfectly right from a language perspective, but from a software engineering perspective, you could not be more wrong. An anti-fragile system, an anti-fragile architecture is not a closed solid system. It's fluid. It's a system that gets better under stress and under load. So the more you beat it down, the better it performs. So when you start to think about systems that behave this way, you start to think about, okay, where could I find examples of such anti-fragile fluid architectures that could inspire me? And you realize your immune system, your muscles, the more you work down, an ant colony, the more you beat these small little insects down, the better they get. The more you exercise, the stronger you get. Your system that you've designed performs better under load and stress and disaster. So I think this is a valuable idea that as we all go through software design and development, I think we should consider, and even from a project management perspective and, and social aspects of, of, of controlling a project, that we should strive for ideals that allow us to not be solid and resilient and robust and you know, controlled. That's all very good things. But it's extremely important that as things get worse, whether it's thousands and thousands of users logging in, or whether it's loads and loads of data uh, coming into our system, it's a whole lot better if the system improves and gets better and better and better and adjusts itself dynamically as the conditions of the environment improve. 
One very good example of this for all you geeks out there, if you want to actually see how this is, this is in practice applied, you want to look at a project from Netflix called The Chaos Monkey. And they have this, they have this thing, this, this agent, this virus that they deploy in production in real time whose job is to go out and randomly kill application servers and nodes on the purpose. It is trying to destroy the environment. And as they introduce this load and stress, the system improves, it detects failure, and it starts to actually get better and better and better and better until the monkey sort of goes away, or I guess goes to sleep, and the system sort of calms down. And it's a very, very valuable example, especially as you start to deal with enterprise-level applications, deployments, and, and users that have these expectations today from your systems. And that would be uh, that the, the sort of software that, that employs these strategies, these organic found, uh, architectural decisions, certainly if you ended up working on it, deploying it, you would be much happier, your cholesterol levels would go down, your blood pressure would go down. It's all the organic principles in general. Thank you very much. All right, we've got 20 minutes left, so does anybody else have a lightning talk? Anybody just want to come up and share something about themselves? I'm feeling really bad about kicking Andrew off on that first one now, because we've got time to fill. Andrew, you got, a, you want, got another minute? To... Hey, I'm Jeff Pasch from NYU. Uh, Who's, who's on Sakai 11 right now and using the new gradebook, right? Okay, so one thing we're working on for 12, just to give you a heads up, is a new, it's a refactor of the spreadsheet view, and it uses um, a plugin called Hands-On Table, and that's progressive rendering. So right now, is anybody, does anyone have huge courses using gradebook NG and seeing that it's a little bit slow? Okay, I see one person, so that's good. Um, but this, uh, this refactor will, will solve that. So you could have a course with thousands of users and thousands of items, and there shouldn't be any problem with that. So we're working on it now. We're actually going to be running it in production over the summer um, in 11, but we're committing the work against 12. So that's coming. So look, if I was going to be allowed to do the last minute of the five minutes of the seven minutes of the however many minutes, uh, the universal two-factor, it, it, it's the call to action, right? And so to be clear, I think, I think there's kind of you know, maybe even a moral imperative that we should build into our applications uh, support for users to protect themselves from, from phishing attacks, from, from having their credentials compromised. And, and fortunately, this has technologically come in reach, right? Whether you do it uh, you know, relying upon CAS, where if you read the manual, it says, you know, part of it's kind of an exercise left to the reader, but Misa tells me that if you grab the very latest bleeding edge code, there's actually more there for it, so it's, it's getting better. Um, or if we just engineer this more directly into, uh, into applications through the support and frameworks or not, um, you know, the idea is to allow users who, who are prepared to do so to, to bring additional credentials to the party, uh, potentially universal two-factor credentials, which, which have some attractive properties in that it's a genuine standard. There are genuine multiple vendors producing these credentials, so it's, it's not like you're doing one particular vendor's job for them. You're enabling a, a more generic um, opportunity for users to bring you know, this kind of additional credential to bear. And, and in an ideal world, I would be able to use this one key uh, as an additional credential on many, many, many thousands, potentially, of, of applications that I interact with uh, you know, for additional surety uh, that, um, that, look, even if you get your hands on my password, then that's just not good enough to, you know, as me, get into these applications. Anybody else? Any takers? Maybe I'll take a second, uh, just from the board's perspective, uh, making sure that everybody is aware of an email um, list 
called open at aperio.org. If you have any questions about Aperio or discussion items that you'd like to open up to the community, go out there and drop a note. We'd like to see lots more discussion on there. Any other takers? Well, I want to thank uh, Eric and Andrew and Misa and Jeff for all sharing with us today. And I guess you guys uh, get a few minutes of your life back.